how many of you all have ever been rejected? Was it fun? What a great experience to be rejected, right? Oh, yes, I can't wait till I get rejected again, right? Now, rejection is something that uh, creates um, uh, wounds, right, in our heart. And uh, the more uh, powerful the, the love we have for someone who rejects us, the greater the wound is in our soul. And and we all walk around with different kinds of wounds from rejection that we've experienced. Some rejection is as simple as um, a buddy uh, not inviting you to their birthday party when you're a kid. Uh, or a teenage rejection may be uh, the girl that you have been crushing on uh, tells you no when you ask her for a date or to uh, go to a dance. Um, or they get really creative when they tell you no about going to a dance, and they say, well, I'll meet you there. I, I'm not saying that's a wound. I'm just saying rejection. As you get older, the rejection becomes more grown up, like uh, being passed over for a promotion or not getting the new orders that you hoped that you would get. Uh, rejection is something that we all face but it's not something we should face in the church, in this family. See, we are family, and there is an acceptance that needs to be a core component of who we are. I'm not talking about accepting and compromising the gospel. I'm not saying accepting and, and uh, forgetting what the Bible says. I'm not talking about that at all, but I'm talking about what the Bible talks about when it says that we are to accept others in the same way that Jesus has accepted us. I want you to look at Romans chapter 15. Now, we're con continuing this sermon series on uh, we are family. And as we look at who we are as family, we've been looking in Romans. Next week, we go to 1 Corinthians. But we've been looking in Romans up to this point. Romans, uh, we looked at Romans chapter 12. We looked at Romans chapter 14. Now we're in Romans chapter 15. In these first seven verses... God speaks to us about how to develop building blocks for a healthy family, all right? Uh, I want you to lean into verse 7, okay? Verse 7, and we'll, we'll get there. Now, what verse 7 does, it tells, us, um, it tells us what should occur after we have these building blocks are in, in place, all right? He says, and God says to us, therefore, based upon the building blocks that we're going to, get, we're going to look at in a moment, therefore, welcome one another. Now, that term welcome is proslambano. My one Greek word for 2021 saying out loud, proslambano. It, it means to receive to yourself. It means to open your arms in an embrace. It means to come alongside, invite somebody alongside you as a brother or a sister. It means that you uh, develop family ties with someone. That's, that's what this means. It's not just a, hey, how you doing? It is, we're family. Oh, we are family. Okay? So, therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Now, how has Christ welcomed you? Christ has welcomed us. He's the model that we follow. The way we do family, the way we do church is built upon Jesus. Jesus is the model, okay? Not, not my ideas, not my strategies, not your ideas or your strategy. The model for this family is Jesus, all right? Everybody in agreement there? Okay, if you're not in agreement, that's okay. I hope you'll get to the place of agreement because that's what the Bible tells us, all right? So the model for this family is Jesus. And here's what Jesus did. Jesus looked on you, a sinner, and looked on me, a sinner, and he said, I'm going to do everything I can to bring that person into my family. And Jesus didn't say, as soon as you get your act cleaned up, as soon as you start behaving correctly, as soon as you start doing the right things, then you can be part of my family. 
If Jesus had said that, we would all be lost in utter darkness because none of us can live up to it. None of us can start getting it right. So what did Jesus do? Jesus left heaven to come to earth to cross the chasm that our sin had created between us and God. The king welcomed the pauper. The king welcomed the rebel. Holy God opened his arms to hostile sinners and said, come be part of my family. And Jesus died for sinners on a cross. He paid that ultimate price so that when we put our faith in him, we can cross that bridge and enter into his family so that we are forever in God's family. Hey, We're supposed to treat each other, welcome each other, embrace each other in the same way that Jesus has embraced us. Now, we've been looking, you remember in in Romans 14, uh, Romans 14, we looked at the fidgets that we put in place. And these um, rules and regulations beyond Scripture uh, or taking Scripture out of context, and we we have these these ideas that, that are important to us but they are not important in the big picture of God's things. And in Romans 14, Paul says, and God tells us, that we are dividing the family. We're destroying the work of God in this church because we're taking hold of these fidgets. In Romans 14, the fidgets were you've got to eat certain foods and you've got to celebrate certain days uh, or you're not godly. And... uh, brought into the 21st century in this day and time. It's not just eating and celebrating days or not drinking wine at a meal, which is also Romans 14, Um, but it also would include uh, things like the clothes we wear or don't wear. Did you note that somebody did? I'm wearing a jacket today. Last week when I talked about fidgets, I talked about how I wasn't wearing a jacket. Today I'm wearing a jacket. That's not because I don't want you to... I, I'm just trying to confuse everybody what the attire I'm wearing. You know, I'm just, everybody keep everybody in the dark. But, but, but the reality is, oh, we have Bible dedication today. I want to wear a jacket for Bible dedication. Uh, all right, anyway. So uh, we talked about these fidgets, and these fidgets become all important to us. You are not godly if you don't do these things. But God says, no, 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 no. That's not, that's not the basis of acceptance. In fact, what we see in Romans 14, verse 10, is that, that, uh, that the, the church was rejecting people that didn't take hold of their own fidgets. So what we find here is Paul say, all right, let, uh, we've, we've addressed the fidgets. Now let's deal with the building blocks that create a healthy family. And Jesus has accepted us. Jesus has embraced us. Jesus has welcomed us. Now, we need to welcome and embrace and accept one another. Even though we have these differences of opinion. By the way, did you know that you are different than I am? The things you think are different than the things I think. And the things that are important to you are not necessarily important to me. And the things that are important to me are not necessarily important to you. Do you get that? We're different, but it shouldn't divide us. If you've been married any amount of time, you know that the two people that love each other most, this side of heaven, a husband and a wife, can have differences of opinion. And those differences don't create division in the marriage. They shouldn't. In fact, those differences should create an opportunity of greater love. My goodness, Edie has accepted me when I have been the most difficult and different from her. It's given opportunity for love to blossom. And, and that's, that's what should happen in this church, in the differences. It's not an opportunity for us to divide. It's an opportunity for us to show greater love. And that's kind of what God's getting at in Romans 15, 1 through 7. He, he gives us these building blocks for a healthy family of faith called the church. How can we be healthy now, when we have these differences, how can we be healthy? When, when, when we struggle through the differences that seem to threaten our existence, how can we be healthy? 
Well, that's what these building blocks are about. And they're more than just the three I'm going to mention, but they're only three in this passage that I want us to talk about. And there, there are other building blocks, but uh, Romans 15 talks about these three. And so I want us to look at these building blocks. Now, the other thing, if, if I could just take a moment and break this uh, kind of preacher wall. Um, these building blocks will do our family no good if they just stay on your piece of paper or in your notes, or in your head. These building blocks are commitments that we make. And my prayer is that we all would make these commitments today together, that we live in relationship with one another following these commitments. So what's the first commitment? The first commitment is we will help the weak. I, I, I don't know if y'all know the story of the three bears, uh, three pigs, not three bears, three pigs. You know the story of the three pigs. Uh, there was a big bad wolf roaming the countryside and three pigs knew that they needed a house to live in. And so the first pig built his house of straw and the second one of sticks and then the third one of stone. And I'm sure that the third one that built his house of stone was the older brother who had more wisdom and said, the, the straw is going to fly away, the sticks are going to crumble, but the stone will stick. And so um, I'm sure he advised and tried to pass on wisdom to his younger pig brothers, and they just ignored him. And so the, the first pig built his house of straw, second of sticks, and the third one of stone. When the big bad wolf comes along, he blows, the straw flies away, goes to the second house, and the sticks crumble. And I can imagine the scene when the two pigs who have their house blown up come racing to the door of the big pig brother. And they knock on the door and they say, help, help, we need help. And that pig pig brother says, dude, I told you, I told you, I told you that the straw was going to fly away and the sticks were going to crumble. I, I told you so. I wish you would have just listened to me and you wouldn't be in this trouble anymore. I can't believe. And all of a sudden, Big Bad Wolf comes up. And, and Big Brother's still lecturing the two little pig brothers to their harm and tragedy. Or maybe the scenario is the uh, two little pig brothers come up and they knock on the door and the big pig brother says, you know what? Um, I... I, I tried, I tried, I tried to help you. This is the bed that you've made. Now you're just going to have to lay in it and live with the consequences. Just a little insight. Those two approaches are not the kind of approaches we're looking for in the church. See, the third approach, and the way the story ends, we don't have all this inside uh, 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 Cliff Notes uh, explanations of the little uh, rhyme. All we know is that uh, the two little pigs ran into the uh, big little pig's brother's house, uh, and they were rescued from the big bad wolf. They found protection and refuge there, even though they had blown it, even though they had made mistakes. Now, I... If I can carry this analogy just a little bit further, all of us are like those two little pigs building our lives on straw and stick. Every person here who is a follower of Jesus, every person in our family uh, of faith has made those straw and stick decisions. And we have had to suffer through the straw and stick circumstances and consequences. If I could uh, get out of the analogy, all of us have blown it and it's messed up our lives. All of us have chosen sin. All of us have made bad decisions because of sin or sinful influence, and, and it has messed up our lives. But what God tells us today is those in this room who have learned from those bad mistakes or who are not in the circumstance of those bad mistakes, it's the job of those who are standing strong in the house of stone to help those who have made the straw and stick choices. Here's, here's what he says in verse 1. Uh, uh, he says, uh, we then who are strong 
ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Now, another translation, which I think is better, is, uh, is we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Okay, so that's countercultural. Here's what he's saying. He's saying in the church, in this family, those who are strongest in the faith have an obligation to bear the burdens of our weak brothers and sisters who are living out the consequence of straw and sticks. You made bad choices. You're living in the trauma of those choices. You, you're, you're weak in the faith or you're, you're, you're building your life on, on things that don't really matter. And it is our job who are strong, people who are in the strong, uh, the strong category of the church, It's our job to come alongside you and to help you and to encourage you and to bear up under the burden that you're under because of these uh, straw and stick choices. It's my job when I'm strong to help you when you're weak. And it's your job when you're strong to help me when I'm weak. And all of us at different times are going to be either in the strong category or the weak category, but as family, we're supposed to be in those categories together. It's our obligation. This isn't a suggestion. This isn't a, this isn't a well, if you get around to it, this is the commitment that we make when we are part of First Norfolk Family. We will help the weak. Everybody look this way and say, we are family. Say it again to me. Now turn to the person to your right and say, I will help you when you're weak. Turn to the person to your left and say, I will help you when you're weak. Turn to the person behind you so that you're no longer talking to your spouse or your family. (laughs) Turn to the person behind you and say, I will help you when you're weak. All right, so here's the thing. Not just words we say. It's the commitment of our life as part of this church. I'm going to help you when you're weak. I'm going to bear up under your failings. We'll look at this again. But that's, that's building block number one. A healthy family helps the weak. The second uh, building block we find here is uh, brought about by that last phrase and then verse two and three. Last phrase of verse one. Did you see it? And this is the third week in a row where I've talked about this. Not because it is something delightful for me to talk about. It's because this is the third week in a row when it's in the word of God that I'm preaching. Okay? So don't think that I'm just all of a sudden trying to gig you about something. Giggle Maggie's. I'm I'm not trying to gig you about something. I'm just simply trying to be faithful in delivering the word of God to you today. So the last phrase in verse one. You see it? In, in the grammar, and, and y'all have taken grammar, you know how grammar works. You have a subject, you have an object, and sometimes with the object, you'll have a direct object. In this sentence, in verse 1, there are two direct objects, and they're both in uh, infinitive clauses. One is uh, we ought, uh, or uh, we have an obligation, that's the verb. We is the subject, that's you and me, have an obligation, uh, or ought, that's the verb. Now, what's the direct object? Well, the first direct object is the positive. We ought to bear the failings of the weak. So that's the, that's the object. The second one is in the negative. You see it? We have an obligation. Get this. Countercultural. We have an obligation not to please ourselves. I mean, that, do, not to please ourselves. We have an obligation not 
to please ourselves. I feel like I need to say that over and over again because it's so countercultural. Every person in this room, so much of our culture today and so many things that we teach ourselves and embrace is built on the premise, I ought to please myself. But that's not, that's not what we do in family. In family, we commit to please others and not ourselves. And, I don't know if you know this, but I have a granddaughter. Her name is Nora. And Nora uh, is about a year and a half old. Uh, she is walking around. She is a talking gibberish. Uh, and, and it's wonderful. When she comes to our home, our home becomes a place to bring her pleasure. And that, that's the way it is for parents of, of preschoolers, and I, they're young, and so you're going to do what you can to, not anything they want, but anything you can to please them so that they can grow in a healthy way. So, for instance, in our house, when she comes, and I'm sure in Elizabeth and Will's house as well, when, when Nora comes, we will mute the TV so that we can stop and we can sing. The wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round, round and round. The wheels on the bus go round and round all through the town. The wipers on the bus go shoo, 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 shoo. The wipers on the bus go shoo, 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 all through the town. The babies on the bus go wah, 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 wah. The babies on the bus go wah, 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 all through the town. The mamas on the bus go shh, shh, shh. The mamas on the bus go shh, 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 all through the town. And there are more verses. Well, why do we sing that song to Nora? Because Nora giggles and laughs and she enjoys that. And so we put pause on a Texas A&M and Alabama game so that we can sing Wheels on the Bus. Listen to how Paul described it. The last part of verse 1 says, and not to please ourselves. And then verse 2 and 3. Let each of us, each of us, that's you and me. Not, not some strange person, not some person that you don't know. Each of us, that's every person in this family. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. All right, so Jesus is the model for how we do relationships. And Jesus set the model. He didn't come to please himself. He came to please God and to please us by dying for our sin in our place on a cross, paying the path, uh, paving the pathway by his shed blood into the very family of God. That's the model that we're to follow. Just as Jesus did not live for his own pleasure, you and I are not supposed to be living for our own pleasure in this family. Do you understand how countercultural that is and how offensive it is uh, to some, even some right now who gather with us? It's offensive. I know it is. You've heard me say it over and over again, but I have to say it over and over again. We do not exist to please you. Yeah, you, you, this isn't, you come into this place, it is not about your pleasure, it's not about my pleasure, it's about God's pleasure. But bringing God pleasure means that we look for opportunities to please the other. Jesus was not self-centered, he was other-centered and upward-centered. And you and I must be the same way. Not self-centered, but other-centered and upward-centered. I wonder how many of us would change our behavior in relationship to one another, if we turned our own desires on their head and decided I'm going to be others-centered and upward-centered, God-centered, and not me-centered. Now, do you think that would change the way you live, the way you view your life, the way you view church? It should. 
you realize, again, Jesus is the model for how we do relationships, not, not your preferences. In fact, here in this passage, he says, you put your preferences and those things that you think are going to bring you personal pleasure, you put them on the altar and you sacrifice them. For what? Well, to please your neighbor for their good. Now, what does that mean? Well, Jesus died to bring us into a relationship with himself so that we might be part of God's family. That was the good. Jesus uh, sought to please us by giving us a pathway into God's family, and we are to be in that same kind of mode. We're not just, uh, for instance, we don't let Nora run around in the street just because she wants to. We, you, you know what I'm saying? It, it's not just anything you want. We're not pleasing you for your own, uh, you know, just anything. We're, we're, we're pleasing you in order for you to see how great and good God is. And we're looking for opportunities to build you up as a follower of Jesus. And it's not about me pleasing me. And again, I know, good gracious, I know, I've talked a lot about this. Not nearly as much as the Bible talks about it, but I've talked a lot about this. But the reason we've got to talk about this is because one of the greatest, one of the greatest destroyers of church and family is this deep desire that I get things the way I want them. Self-centered. But that's not the way it's supposed to be in the church. And you might say, well, then how do we make decisions? Well, God's word rules and the weak win. The weak win. Not the strong. The weak win. And you might not enjoy the wheels on the bus go round and round very much. But because we are committed to please the other for their good and for their growth, we will sing the wheels on the bus go round and round. Does that make sense? And by the way, this is the word of the Lord. This isn't the word of Eric Thomas. This is the word of the Lord to our church. All right? So we will help the weak, we will please others, and the third one is we will open the door to hope. What does it mean to open the door to hope? Well, we have people that are absolutely devastated by life, and they're traveling through treacherous terrain every single day, and they're looking for um, help, a help that will give them hope. They're, They're looking for hope. And people around us, people that gather with us, they're looking for hope. I think of it this way. Edie and I went uh, on our 30th wedding anniversary. We traveled uh, out west and uh, in the mountainous regions, the the Rocky Mountain regions of of the west, uh, as you're traveling up and down, uh, before you go uh, up a big uh, mountain uh, uh, terrain, there'll be this little pull-off on the side. It says, pull off here and put chains on your tires. It says it better than that, but but that's what it's saying. It said, uh, you pull off here, chain up area uh, to your right. So uh, in treacherous weather, you pull off and you pull out the chains that are hopefully in your car and you put them on the tires so that you can travel uh, through the te- treacherous terrain safely and get to where you need to go. The problem with that, and just simple problem, I don't know how to put chains on a tire. It doesn't help me anyway to know that there are chains There are chains in the trunk. Great. Don't know how to put them on. I can see the sign that says pull over here. And if you pull over here, then you can put chains on your tires. And and, and great, I'll pull over and I'll get the chains out of the trunk. But if I can't put them on the tires, it doesn't do me any good. And then I discover in the glove box, what do I discover? Directions. Instruction manual. Here it is. And I can follow the non-IKEA kind of instructions that have English written in words and pictures and diagrams that are clear. And and I can follow those directions to put the chains on the tires so that I can then travel through treacherous terrain and get to my destination safely. 
What we find in verses four, in verse four, is that God has given us his word to help us put on Jesus Christ so that we can travel from here to heaven. Even through treacherous terrain, we can travel from here to heaven safely. Now, uh, here's how Paul wrote it, verse 4. Whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we, through the patience and comfort of scriptures, might have hope. What made Paul think about scripture is that he quoted scripture in verse, uh, in verse 3. The very last part of verse 3 is a quotation from Psalm 69, 9, and he applied it to Jesus. Jesus is the one who suffered reproach that was meant for God. Jesus took it on himself. And so that, that's the message there. And so Paul was like, wow, this is part of uh, being a family too. It's that scripture points us to Jesus, and Jesus is the source of all hope. And our job, our job is to help each other Read the instruction manual to put on Jesus. Our job is to help each other see the right and the wrong of life through the filter of God's Word. Our job is to uh, help one another understand the power of God's greatness and holiness and righteousness and majesty and the joy that we get in serving Him as we unveil God's Word. Here in this passage, God's Word gives us comfort in trying times. God's Word gives us endurance in challenging times. God's Word gives us hope that will help us every day we live from here to heaven. So instead of turning to TikTok to try to find a way to navigate life, we need to turn to God's Word and allow the Spirit of God to seep into our soul and give us hope in the face of hopelessness. You know, we live in a time where people are filled with despair because they have no hope. And we have hope that we are to share here and now. Are you sharing hope with one another by sharing the truth of God's Word with one another? God's Word helps us put on Jesus so that we navigate treacherous terrain from here to heaven safely. Well, these are the three building blocks, but they're useless unless you and I make a commitment to pursue them. These building blocks lead to a specific destination. When we commit to help the weak, to please um, others for their good and and, and for their growth, when we commit to open the door to hope by turning to God's Word, when we do those things, what's the result? The result is we, First Norfolk, become a place for God's glory to shine. And whether you know it or not, that's the big deal here. The big deal of the church is God's glory. The big deal of the church is that we are the theater for God's glory. I want you to look as we close, verses 5 and following. 5, 6, and 7. It says, Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, receive welcome one another, just as Christ also received, welcomed us to the glory of God. You know, how we relate to one another is an essential ingredient in us bringing glory to God. How we relate to one another is spelled out by these commitments that we make to one another. I will help you when you're weak. I will do all that I can to please you and not myself. 
I will open the door to hope for you by turning our focus and treasuring God's Word. And when we do that together, make no mistake, we live like-minded. Like-minded doesn't mean that we get, get rid of our differences. No, we, our differences remain. There are Cowboys fans in here, and there are Redskins fans in here. And those are fidgets that aren't going to change. But despite our football team allegiances, we are like-minded because together we have committed to serve God's purpose and serve his, uh, do his work in our world together so that we might shine the greatness, the majesty, the glory, the beauty of God in the seven cities of Hampton Roads and even around the world with one voice, with one heart. We praise God. So the question is, will you make that commitment with me? Will you join me in that commitment? A commitment to help those who are weak. A commitment to please others, not ourselves. A commitment to open the door to hope by treasuring God's word together. Look, if you make that commitment, then we will be a church where God is moving with such might and power that he begins to do the infinitely above and beyond things that we could, even ask, could ever ask or even imagine. We are the theater for his glory. Don't you want to join together on that journey to see what God can do? Bow your heads with me, please. I know it's, it's shocking sometimes when you hear somebody say that our job is not, our obligation is not to please ourselves. Can, can I give you this while you let the Spirit of God ruminate in your mind and heart right now? Can, can I just give you this? One thing we know is that if you and I commit today to please others, for their good and for their growth. If you and I commit today in the present to please others, then we can be confident that God will please us in the end. Will you make that commitment? In these next few moments, we're going to sing our praise to the Lord, and it's a time for us to respond to what God has spoken, and some of us are going to need to come to the altar and talk to God personally or come to one of the ministers at the front and talk to God. If you're here today and you're not yet a follower of Jesus and you have questions about what that means, I invite you to come and talk to one of the ministers here at the front while we're singing. Maybe you just need to sit where you are. Maybe you need to stand and lift your arms and your hands and your voice to the Lord. But this is a time for you to respond to God, not to a preacher, not to a talk. Respond to God as his spirit is working in your heart. What is he calling you to do? I'd love, I mean, I would love personally to see so many of you making a commitment. Say, I commit myself to these three building blocks so that our church would be a theater for God's glory. Now, however you do that is between you and God, but that would be my hope. So, Father, in these next few moments as you speak to your people, I pray that we would... Uh, be obedient to you and responding to how you've led us. And Father, if there are any in the room here today who have yet to enter into your family through faith in Christ, I pray by your spirit, you would open their eyes to see their need for Jesus, that you would draw their hearts to embrace this wondrous gift of life that you offer through the death of Christ and his resurrection from the dead. I pray that you give those whom you are drawing the courage to say, yeah, that's me and I need to do something about it right now. So, Father, in these next few moments, I pray that you would speak and we would listen and respond as you call us to respond. Strengthen our hearts and lead us in the pathway 
new though it may be, lead us in the pathway that glorifies you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.